Chidi, um, obviously uh, you have a Nigerian heritage and you've been exposed to Iraq and uh, Iran. Now, putting it in contest here, just opposing the, the, uh, what the general has described, do you think there is any, any semblance of, in, you know, as with regards to insecurity, what is happening in the Southeast today? Does that call to mind what probably you may have experienced in Iraq and Afghanistan? Okay, so in the context of, you know, the maybe my experiences in Iraq and Afghanistan, I would say broadly no, uh, for the simple reason that uh, in Afghanistan, when I deployed, that was where, you know, there was heavy fighting there. That was more uh, combat, more akin to what's happening in northeast Nigeria. In Iraq, I would say the similarities that I would try and draw were between, will be with Iraq, where when I deployed in 2004, we were in that period just after the war ended and before the major insurgency started, just as the insurgency was kicking off. And what's the similarities, although you're, they're not exactly the same, what, the, what I'm going to try and draw out is that we're in the same phase as is happening uh, now in the Southeast, that was happening when I was there, which is the preparation phase. So what's happening now, as we can see in the Southeast, is somebody and who the actors are, is, you know, is up for debate, is preparing for something bigger. They're doing this by just attacking the security forces, attacking the police. This has at least three or four different effects. The first effect, obviously, is to gather weapons. Uh, so you get weapons, you get arms, you get ammunition. Second is to remove that uh, police presence um, by actually physically destroying their fake vehicles, physically destroying their buildings. So that prevents the police from actually having a, a presence and providing whatever security they might provide. The, the third effect is terrorizing the police in of themselves. So every policeman now, know, now knows going on to a checkpoint or going in on a patrol or going to your police station, you're at risk of being attacked, you're at risk of being killed. You can see that in the latest attacks, the police flee without even putting up that much of a resistance. So that terror effect is working. And the fourth is to message to the population. Now, it's no secret to any Nigerian that the Nigerian police are not popular. You know, and in the Southeast, we all know the experience of uh, having a checkpoint every 10 meters, having, you know, trying to move a, your goods from one point to another and being harassed by the police or calling police if there's a problem, they'll tell you there's no fuel and all of this kind of harassment. So by attacking the police, although people might not approve of it, they are not a popular target. It's not the same as if you're attacking churches or you're attacking schools or you're attacking factories. You're attacking somebody that's already disliked. So it messages to the population that, listen, we've understood you, we've heard your cries and we're getting rid of uh, something that bothers you. Ask any evil businessman what bothers him, and he'll tell you other than you know the normal infrastructure. It's the checkpoint. It's the harassment. How much it costs you to move goods from Lagos? How many when you cross the Niger Bridge? Uh, how many uh, checkpoints you will see per kilometer, as opposed to on the other side? It's a very it's very clever messaging. You know, it's propaganda of the deed. Uh, but the final thing I'm just going to try and uh, uh, mention is just to draw back to you know a comment you made earlier about um, the Southeast being the most secure region. Technically, that's true, in my opinion. But at the same time, security in Nigeria is relative. Whilst uh, I don't think there's any of us uh, from the East who doesn't know someone who has been kidnapped or who doesn't know anybody, people who are being attacked on the road, armed robbers, all of this kind of stuff. So our security might not be at the level, or oh, sorry, wrong, our insecurity might not be at the level of the Northeast where you've got uh, uh, Boko Haram or the Northwest where you've got bandits kidnapping uh, huge numbers. But we still have a high level of insecurity. And this is all built into the mix of what's happening now. Thank you very much. So if I, if I draw from what you've just said, does that mean every one of us should be worried? Yes. Really? So, um, you know, this, so what you're saying is this is just the beginning. It's going to get worse. We should raise it, up. Yes, it's going to get worse. This is, this is essentially what you will find after this phase. It might go quiet for a bit. And that will be not because they've been defeated or because they're quiet. That's because they've got everything they need. They've, they've fixed the police in by, you know, destroying their infrastructure, by terrifying them. They've got enough weapons. There's, they've opened up, you know, links either to the Niger Delta or to Southern Cameroons to get weapons. And then the next phase will start. And that will be much heavier attacks, attacks on the army, trying to take on the army. And the point of taking on the army is, again, multiple reasons. Number one, to defeat the army, to fix the army, to gather weapons heavier weapons. So right now they've got rifles, they've got um, pistols. They haven't got heavy machine guns, they've not got RPGs. They will get that from the army by knocking over a few army checkpoints of army patrols. 
But more importantly, when you hit the army, the army will retaliate. We all know the Nigerian army. They will retaliate. They will, they will attack innocent civilians and that will cause people to come over to their cause. And at that point, you will see open facilitization where this group, whoever they are, will now identify themselves and say, this is who we are and this is what we're doing. And we are your only defenders against these people. And if they are really, and if their intentions are really, um, uh, as you can see, there's been attacks on Hausa traders in, in Olu and other places, you know, then it will be to provoke, you know, and attacks on Ibozi outside Nigeria, outside uh, the Southeast, yeah. to provoke that, that crisis that leads them to say, so many of us, uh, I mean, I'll speak for myself, I don't support secession, I don't support IPOB or, or a new Biafra or whatever it is. But when the choice is presented to you are evil, therefore you're going to be massacred. And then somebody comes and says, I'm your only defender. That is a choice that will be presented to people. And this is where this crisis will now escalate beyond what, where it is now. I do not know if at the time in, you, know, you were in Iraq and in Afghanistan to keep security aside the external forces there. Do you think there is anything to learn from, you know, the experiences there. Do they have something like these local vigilante as well that we have in the Southeast, Chidi? Yes. Uh, so there's several, there's, there's several key points. Uh, I think the first, the, the, the first one I'm going to say before, in fact, before I say, uh, go into the first point, I'm just going to say, I'll, I'll very respectfully disagree with uh, General Mahi, some of his points, uh, especially in terms of the preparation of setting up everywhere at Agu, that, that we couldn't have done this earlier. I mean, one of the key things, uh, one of the key adages that we all know is, it, it, you know, if you desire uh, peace, you prepare for war. And and I, sitting in the UK, you know, predicted exactly what is happening now as far back as 2014, 2015. Uh, I knew that I saw the indicators, I knew what was coming, and I wrote a, a very, I wrote a series of very long articles and shared them with as many people as I could to say, this is what is coming, and we need to prepare. There's an insurgency coming, and it's going to, this is how it is going to be. They will start with the police, they will start attacking, they will start taking weapons. Uh, and this is what, if, if, we could, if we could see it from here, or I could see it from here, I, can't, I don't understand why the political leaders in, in, uh, in Nigeria couldn't see it and couldn't prepare for this and prevent. And the fact we keep you know, saying to ourselves that the Southeast is the most secure region, as I said, this is not true. Uh, we, are, we are plagued by armed robbers. We are plagued by kidnappers. We are plagued by you know, uh, area boys, whatever it is, all kinds of cultists and everything. These are all people who predate upon the population. And what we need to understand is that it's why we're having this response now is not because the, uh, the region is insecure. It's because the insecurity is now targeting the state. We have left the people to their own devices. We have vigilantes all over the Southeast already. So this is just a, you know, and, and again, we could have prepared much better for it. But to go back to your question, uh, the, the key thing I was actually going to say is that Iraq and Afghanistan are actually the worst examples that we could take for the Southeast in particular. I mean, we can look at some of the examples from Afghanistan and apply it to the Northeast, but the examples we're applying uh, is just essentially how to fight this war better. And if, by the time you've got to the stage of war, you've already failed. We should never have got to the stage in the Northeast where we are calling down airstrikes on our own, on our own cities, on our own towns, on our own people, like it's happening now in the Southeast where you have uh, airstrikes happening in all of you know and for uh, maybe for those of us who have read nigerian history we understand number one the impact of airstrikes on the Igbo psyche you know from what people suffered during the war we understand that this area where this crisis happened all Uli, all these kind of places these were the last places to fall during the war and if you want it's a very strange kind of psychological memory that it triggered in me and i i, I didn't see the war but in me, somebody who understood the war, I under, for me to see airstrikes in this area again, it's something that's, that's, that's you know, on, on very, very curious that we can, that it goes without comment. But the lessons that I'm going to take from my experiences in, in Iraq and Afghanistan are this, in that local forces were generated, in, and I'm going to use Afghanistan for this mainly, and then I'll defer to Iraq. Local forces were generated in Afghanistan. There were several layers of forces. The first were the police, like the, uh, I'll call them the town and the, and the village police. There, there's other names, but this is what I'm going to use. So the, the, like the town police, they generally had their uniforms, uh, they had their weapons were a little bit better, they had better vehicles. 
sometimes uh, later on in the conflict, they had mentors from NATO who would stay with them, train them up. The village police were locally recruited. They had terrible weapons. They were almost always high. Uh, they took, oh, they just smoked opium all day, uh, beat up the locals, took their motorcycles, took their money, collaborated with the Taliban. They used to rape little children. So, I mean, you know, without uh, going into too much detail, as, as curious as it is, you know, there's a, there's a, straight, there's a very curious subculture particularly in Afghanistan, of, of, of um, men sleeping with little boys. Um, mm. And they would take these boys into their compounds, into their police compounds. And, you know, whenever we come, they'll go and hide the boys or whatever it is. But that was, you know, so I, this was, you can imagine if this is, if you have this police post in your village, uh, these guys turn up, they are taking your crops, they are taking your motorcycle, they are raping your, your little kids. Uh, Taliban will come, they will just go and chill. The Taliban will do their own thing and go. Imagine the, 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 how that made the villagers feel about the government. And then the federal police would try and do their best, but, you know, they were generally outgunned. And then the other layers then were, you know, the Afghan National Army and then obviously NATO troops. And even us as NATO troops, um, you know, our job was to protect the population. But our main effort, what we've spent most of our time doing was fighting and defending ourselves. Because, and this is a problem, this is something I'm going to highlight, you know, throughout whatever I say this evening, is we didn't have enough men. So in my compounds where, where we were based, uh, we were in a place called the Green Zone, which is, although Afghanistan in the south is mainly desert, it's an irrigated part along the Helmand River, which is kind of like, it's very jungly. And it's, it's, it's you know, that's where a lot of the fighting took place. My compound was at the, was at the front. And, you know, the villagers will pass and not see the Taliban are in the house to tell you. We couldn't do anything. We didn't have enough men to go out and fight them. When they did, they, they didn't have enough. They couldn't push us out from where we are. But at night, they would just, you know, if they wanted to infiltrate, they'll go through the, around us because we didn't have enough men to dominate the ground. When you add all of these factors in, again, the most important factor we have to underline in all of this is that this is a war for the people, amongst the people. We couldn't protect the people as, as NATO troops. The Afghan National Army couldn't protect the people because we were too busy fighting the Taliban and defending ourselves. The federal police couldn't protect the people because they were too busy fighting the Taliban and defending themselves. The village police couldn't protect the people because they didn't want to and they were just there getting high, stealing and raping little children. So the only people, the, uh, the uh, sorry, wrong, the only organization the people could turn to for anything was the Taliban. Because when they go to the Taliban, yes, they will give them harsh punishments, whatever it is, but they know that if they go to the Taliban court and they judge a case, the case is finished. They will judge a case. Whether I win or I lose, I know case is finished today. You go to the uh, Afghan uh, government court, you will spend how many weeks, just like in Nigeria, you will bribe judge, bribe this, bribe that, court will be adjourned. Whoever can bribe the most will win. You have a problem with somebody, you go to the Taliban, they will judge Islamic law. Everybody understood Islamic law. Everybody understood tribal law. Whether you agree or not, you understood it. But somebody is now bringing laws, Afghan government law that was drawn from some from uh, the Soviet times, some from, you know, um, the tribal times. And you're trying to judge that case over months and months. It doesn't uh, apply to the people. Okay. So, so I mean, sorry, just to, to get the final point I'm trying to make is that when we're this war, that is the war that is happening, hopefully that will not get to the point that I'm talking about, is a war amongst the people, for the people, and it's going to be fought by the people. And the only thing that is important, it's not about protecting the government, it's not about protecting police stations, it's about protecting the people. If the people believe they are safe, then they will, su they will support you. If not, every single human being amongst us, whether it's me sitting here safe in London, if my life is threatened, I will go to whatever is pro protect me. And if the government is sitting in, someone is sitting in Abuja, I know where they're telling me that I will support the government whilst um, my, I'm being beaten up or my house is being burnt, I will go to whoever can protect me. And that has to be the underlying guiding principle of anything that comes, protect the people above all everything else, even so, to the risk of taking casualties amongst the security forces. So now, you know, understanding, obviously, understanding the need to have this security outfit, and just opposing with your experience, what is it that you're going to tell those in charge of this security outfit from experience? First and most important thing is understand the problem. Now, we're not going to understand the problem in its totality because, as I said, there's many different elements to what's going on now. I don't think all of it is IPOP, all of it is ESN. I don't, some of it is politics, some of it is criminality, some of it is um, all, of a, all other measure of things. 
But we need to understand that the key underlying grievance in Igbo land is that people are not secure and people have no faith in the government. So there has to be a holistic approach. No. And the most important, sorry, go on. No, no, okay. I mean, I, I'm listening to what you're saying. And, you know, it's, it's before we lose sight here. Isn't, are we, you know, aren't we supposed to be blaming the person who controls the federal police? Because actually, that we are talking, that we are having this conversation of setting off something for a people is as a result of the federal policing system, isn't it? Yes, they, they, they have failed. The National Security Advisor, the IGP, I mean, we shouldn't even be bringing the COAS into this. I mean, the fact that the army is getting involved, again, is a failure of the IGP. Uh, it's a failure of the Minister of Police. And none of these people are ever held accountable. And that's something that, again, is surprising to me, that why haven't the uh, uh, Igbo Senators, Igbo House of Reps members called these guys to say what is going on? We should not be having vigilantes because the police should be taking care of business. But, G.D., having listened to all these things, what do you think? Well, we're in trouble. That's the first thing. Uh, the most important thing, I think, is that we need to make a very clear understanding of, of what the issue is here. And there's several very serious issues that we need to address. Uh, the first for me is that I've said it for the beginning. The, the only way you win this war and maybe we don't make it a war before we even get to the war is to protect the people. We, you know, I, 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 again, with respect to the journal, um, saying our problem is ESN, our problem is IPOB, is, is not the way to go. And to say that the diaspora is misinformed that we support IPOB, if you know the diaspora, how, how much we have challenged IPOB, how much we have, how the insults and the back the, uh, the, 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 that we've taken from these guys because of challenging them. When I, 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 you know, and as the, the fellow was saying, it is our people back home that, you know, when they text me, they will be telling me I'm in Biafra land and I'll be challenging them and the insults you'll be getting just for, for trying to say, to steer away from this. I know how much I'm giving out to my relatives just so that they don't get tempted into going to, down this road. We are, the, we are the biggest. So the point I'm making is that we are the biggest kind of bulwark you're going to get against IPOP propaganda. If you, IPOB is not a threat to evil land. IPOB is an irritant. And Nam Dekano at best is like a prosperity pastor. All he needs to do is generally coil his hair. He collects tithes every month. He goes talking about miracles every year. He will give prophecy. This will happen. Biafra, this will happen. There's a moon is going to show. Uh, Israel will come and fight for us. Every year, nothing happens. Same as every pastor in Nigeria giving prophecy every year that nothing happens. He's a 419 man. Sorry for any IPOB members here. You're following a 419 man. He will collect his money. He will sit here in England. The key question we need to ask ourselves is why is he sitting here in England? He spends all his time talking about how evil Britain is, how the Queen hates the, uh, Britain is plotting against Nigeria, but he sits in England. The Nigerian government very curiously has never extra asked for his extradition. We have an extradition treaty with Britain. Why is he in England? Why hasn't he been extradited? Why are the iPop channels still broadcasting? It's very, I can sit in my house and block their channels. Why are they still broadcasting? Why are, they still, why are their accounts still functioning? My point is that I don't understand how IPOP functions and how the Nigerian government functions. If I was a conspiracy theorist, I would say that IPOP is a very convenient uh, scapegoat for the government. Anytime there's a problem, you know, all of a sudden IPOP flares up. Maybe that's, maybe that's going a little bit too far. But the most important thing I want to focus on, again, I will keep bringing it back to this, is protecting the people. But the, most, the best way you could protect the people is crafting a narrative that supports, that the people can buy into. Now, IPOB is popular amongst the people because it's talking about the things that affect all of us. They, they, they are clearly saying, they're talking about the corruption, they're talking about the crime, they're talking about the insecurity. We have governors, Akuzu Saas. The governor took that, the guy, the DPO, and made him his special advisor. Are you telling me he didn't know this man had so many cases against him? How can you trust that man now to protect your security when you take your oppressor and make him your special advisor? Why is that man not being tried? If we want to, do, if we want to win this, this fight, we have to create a narrative that everybody believes in. The enemy and the way to create that narrative is not to turn evil against evil. Not to turn us against, I don't support Taipo, but I don't support Namdekan. I've said it here with my chest that I think he's a 419 man. But that doesn't mean I will now go and start turning my energy to confront Taipo when Ibo land is under threat from so many other things. The biggest threats in Ibo land are not Taipo. 
if it's not even full on heads, man, they're a threat, but they're not the biggest threat. It is crime. You tackle. You um, get the support of the people, and if, the, the, so one last point is is that what creating that narrative it also means you have to be sympathetic to people. I mean, I know you don't, and I, and part of the problem we have again is that especially when we're talking, I, you know, when you're talking, it reminded me sometimes of talking to my dad. I'm talking to the general, he's talking to my dad when I'm challenging him. He gets very angry and he's like, "You don't know what's going on," and you've got to understand that we know what's going on. I, I, on my phone here, I have pictures from when the attacks were going on. People were sending me videos. People were sending me this. We know what's going on. So you have to, there has to be a way that we, you communicate with us that we're, we're, we're on your side. As I said, this audience that you have here would have actually been your best audience because we are not pro wipe uh, in the majority in the, in the diaspora. But by not listening to some very valid points, You've, you've changed, you know, if you look at the chat, you'll see you've turned a lot of people off from what could be a very positive uh, outcome for yourself. So I would say, let's create that narrative of our enemies are the criminals, the bandits. And if you say that, okay, but in the, in the way of catching these bandits, we, we clamp down on IPOB as collateral damage. No one is going to stop you, but protect the people from crime. And that will stop these problems. Do not attack the people. Do not call in airstrikes. Yeah. And the other thing I would say finally is that what we don't, and I'll say this in the open because you can check this is all from open source. The Nigerian military is extremely weak. Right now, what I'm tracking on my this thing is what's happening in Damasak. For how many times this week, I swap us over one Damasak. And that's where all our forces. We do not have the resources. We do not have the men to fight in Ibo land. And Ibo land, if we decide to fight in Ibo land, it will suck in the entire Nigerian army. So this is not something anybody is going to win. All that will happen is that Ibo land will be destroyed. IPOB ESN will never rule over the ashes. Nobody's going to support them. The federal government will not do any, it will not gain anything out of this. So there has to be a, a different way of approaching this. If you really want to tackle IPOB and ESN, then there are legal ways, exit execution, you know, put in a red order to get a bank account shut down. Don't use military force. And then again, try and tackle the youth, speak to them and tell them, listen, we understand, we hear your pain. Put that guy from Marcos Osas on, uh, on, uh, on trial. You know, remove the checkpoints. And these things will start, to, and, and, and you will isolate the criminals from the people and will resolve this problem. Let the rest of Nigeria, I don't want the rest of Nigeria to burn, but let's not bring what's happening in Borno State into Igbo land, and it will happen. If you know how much the Nigerian military wants to, <laughs> wants to come down on the Igbos, I, I don't know how to say this, you know, without being too hyperbolic, but... We're walking into a, into a trap here, and I, and I would hope that people will, will understand that it, it's not in my hands, it's not in the hands of the ordinary people, it's in the hands of the leadership. The governors need to listen, that, to listen to the people, and they need to sensitize. Hold town hall meetings, hold a series of town hall meetings, listen to people's problems, and then from there, you'll be able to, at least, even if you don't act on everything, people will feel they're being listened to, and then move on from there and hopefully bring this down a little bit. I mean, that, that's as much as I'll say, you know, on account of time. Thank you very much, oh, actually. Sorry. And uh, in, in, in run, uh, sorry, General, in rounding sorry. up, please. Sorry. In rounding up, General, I will let you have the last word. But before I do, um, someone that I was supposed to call up before, um, I think he logged out his back now. That's the last person that sadly we can take. Nze Ugoibe, please, can you quickly unmute yourself? Ah, la, 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 la. Yeah.